Đây. Để để để. Mày đi. À Jerry thì can start now. Thank you. Okay. Hello everyone. I uh, hope you had a good lunch. So um, we were just in the process of going through examples of various types of disruption. Um, and I'd put up that slide, um, but we were using a spreadsheet to complete the responses from yourselves. So can we have a spreadsheet up again? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure who's yeah. operating the computer. Okay, I'm sharing. Thank you. So do you want people to share more disruptions or? I maybe just put the spreadsheet again so we can remind ourselves of the uh, ideas that people put forward. Um, and then I was going to suggest some other ideas. Can you see my screen? I'll I just share. Ah, I can see it now. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Just move it onto my other screen. Okay. Whoops. So I keep losing the screen. Ah, here it is. Okay. So we had a few examples. Uh, thank you. Uh, there was a supply chain disruption, like spare parts was the example. Uh, and the cause was a pandemic um, effect on stakeholders and the impact on the business was cost uh, and potentially passenger disruption. Um, the supply chain is really important because um, of course an airline relies on a lot of suppliers. So the same thinking about spare parts can be extended to to a range of other supplies. Um, and exam one of the examples we've seen so far, and one I've experienced myself is uh, fuel supplies. So as a supply chain supplying fuel, and clearly that has, that can have a significant effect. It's clearly it's supplying fuel to an airport, um, but you would normally be planning to pick up fuel at a certain airport. Uh, usually the main hubs, but also sometimes other airports. Uh, and so there could be disruption and um, disruption that could be quite short term or quite long term. 
uh, and depending on which airport is affected would depend how you can respond. Clearly, if it's a, a main hub, response could be quite costly or disruptive. Uh, but if it's a lesser airport, then typically you may want to be, if it's shorter routes, like domestic routes, tankering fuel, um, so carrying more fuel, uh, so you can read the aircraft and do return trips, uh, but clearly that adds cost because more weight adds higher fuel demand on the aircraft. So where, in, uh, where a supply chain is, um, has had disruption will affect how you respond. Another really useful example is food supply, um, onboard uh, meals. Um, if you supply your own meals or you have contractors, all, all suppliers have to be supplied with, with food and food supply chains can easily be disrupted. Um, by a number of reasons. Of course, the worst case, I guess, would be a food contamination problem because it can take quite a long time to re for a supplier to recover from um, such incidents. Uh, the next one we had was IT, then uh, when checking sometimes a whole system. Yeah, uh, we've seen numerous examples of that occurring quite frequently in, in airlines. Um, of IT systems and we're totally dependent on them. Um, but remember there are other IT systems, supplier IT systems as well. So an airport might have its own system. Uh, a lot of airlines rely on common systems like CETA, CETA global system. Um, and you have a problem with CETA system, it can affect not only your own airline, but others as well. Um, Security has IT systems. If a security system has an IT problem, it can affect passenger load and the cost. Um, if we've got maintenance department, aircraft cancelled due to regular maintenance. So what could affect a maintenance department? Um, aside from spares, clearly human resources, um, health incident. But also there's a whole range of other things that could affect your maintenance department. For example, power supplies. Power supply to the hangar, aircraft can't do its B check, isn't ready for a line as required. Uh, power supplies to aircraft, um, when they're into air, air, aircraft along at the gate need power. So a whole range of impacts from power on, on your maintenance department. But clearly other parts of the business need power. The IT system needs power, so that can easily be disrupted. Um, all the offices, airports, all power supplies, absolutely essential. And Although most of the critical supplies have backup generators, they don't always fire up. Even fuel supplies, fuel pumps need power. So power is a really, really important one and understanding where your power supplies are coming from uh, to each of your, at least your main hubs is really quite useful. Another one I wrote down here is fire. Um, fire in a main terminal, clearly very disruptive. If you, your main passenger terminal is affected by fire, how do you respond to that? Um, some airports may have more than one terminal or more than one building, but most are pretty centralized. Um, so that's certainly one that you need to be thinking of. Fire could occur in a hangar, so therefore it's long-term uh, disruption to your engineering department could occur in spare spare parts building. So um, your parts are damaged or or not available. There's um, numerous examples there. Um, also, perhaps thinking of fire is also fire suppression systems. 
the compliance requirements may be that you need a fire suppression system that is functioning. But if that is for some reason not available, then you cannot use a building. So, so there's actually quite a lot of supplies we rely on every day that may not be self-evident, but are absolutely needed to, to keep the airline functioning, either in the immediate term or in the short term. Um, there was an interesting one occurred in Auckland um, about two or three years ago, um, and it was traffic holdup. There was, for some reason, I think there were a combination of roadworks and air traffic and a road accident, a major road accident. And all the traffic routes to the airport were blocked or running extremely slowly. So no one could get to their flights on time. So there was no point flying the aircraft because there weren't any passengers. So that's an interesting one where you have all no control but where stakeholders may have control and where talking to stakeholders and at least ensuring stakeholders understand the implications of decisions they may, may be part of a mitigation plan. Uh, another one that crosses my mind, um, depending part of a world, part world, what part of the world, you may have earthquakes, um, which clearly after an earthquake, even if the runway isn't damaged, the runway has to be checked uh, to ensure it's not damaged. So it takes time. Um, thinking of assets that could be damaged by earthquakes, assets may fail anyway. For example, hangar doors may become jammed. And it can take quite a significant amount of time to repair, um, I'd say, a hangar door, a very large hangar door. So there's all sorts of each part of a business needs to really understand what it needs to continue to supply, uh, to continue to do its role. And only by first identifying all the threats to that, or first what you need, your role in a business, and then what could threaten uh, those needs is part of a business continuity management system that we need to put in place. So the next part some uh, odd situation in Ho Chi Minh City last time when uh, we have uh, heavy rain in uh, such a short period of time in around one hour and uh, the airport get flooded and also all the routes to the airport. Okay. The airport. And another one that uh, we have uh, a situation in uh, Hanoi airport, Mobile airport, uh, where we have uh, one bridge connecting from Hanoi to the airport and the bridge got checked jammed because of some accident in the on, on the bridge and that is a, almost the only way to the airport okay mm. get to the airport to check in so i think both cases can can be that's interesting yes the rains was it was the rains about a year or two ago what i i thought about two or three years ago yeah I, it, I remember it in the news i were Dreadful um, rains, weren't they? Mm. Have to be diverted to Cambodia. Mm. Mm. Yeah, they were in the news here. The rains, yeah. See, now we are okay. still uncertain uh, for the uh, uh, COVID 19 uh, pandemic, uh, which uh, can cause any business disruption. Excluding uh, what we have uh, witnessed. Mm. Okay. So uh, you mean additional impacts? The uncertainty. Yeah, we don't. Uh, we don't know what business uh, disruption may uh, may happen. Uh, yeah. From now on. Mm. Yes, it's interesting. We all thought, I think, that it would be over in a year, but 
it's not. <laughs> yeah. Uncertainty. Yeah, it's a really significant point. Uncertainty. Business uncertainty. It's difficult to make decisions and invest when there's such uncertainty. Okay, so we've got quite a few examples here. Um, we'll return to these if we can later on in the course, um, and then we'll test some of our thinking around um, framework against each of these examples. Okay, thank you. So the next part of the course is the next slide set. Which I'll just open up now. And share screen. Okay, you should be seeing a um, title slide back two of four. Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. Um, just a reminder of what we're trying to achieve here. But the objective, of course, is to develop a good working level understanding of business continuity management and planning as applicable to parts of a full service airline group and to form a foundation for the development of a core expertise in business continuity management. And if we go back to the agenda, we've so far covered the fundamentals of business continuity management, the nature of disruption. We've looked at a range of different types, chronic and acute disruption, a number of different examples of how they can occur, past examples, as well as thinking about what could happen in the future. Uh, and also we went through the ACAO requirements and touched on the IATA guidance. One thing I haven't included here was that international standard. Part of the reason not to include is I, I personally think it's it's overly detailed, overly onerous. Oops, sorry. So what we'll cover off next is developing a BCM framework and, and how to manage events. So the framework I'm going to step through is not laid down in the textbook, it's not a compliance, it's not a requirement, but hopefully it'll give an example of a sort of framework, what a framework could look like or can look like. So we've looked at the nature of impacts and types of, just lightly, we've looked at a significant business disruption may or may not be associated with sudden or catastrophic event. So we've looked at chronic or slow happening events that can still have a significant disruption in business or threaten, uh, and can have occurred or could threaten to occur. So that's not quite written correctly. Such sub events we've seen are can be the failure of suppliers or contractors, internal or external disruptions, natural disaster, failure of utility services, particularly power, but also it could equally be water or even sewerage. They're all critical parts of the infrastructure that keeps a building or a facility functioning um, or other similar unexpected events. Even, I don't know, question marks over the structural integrity of a building so it can't be used so people have to evacuate. There's all sorts of reasons. And we talked about, briefly touched on where events can be acute or chronic, i.e. fast acting or developing over time. And the business can be affected, but also it can be associated with emergencies. And I gave examples, typical business, uh, aircraft or airline examples that occur from time to time and quite normal, but also significant events such as a failure of an IT system or worst case is the events around an aircraft accident. 
so given we have a whole range of different things that can occur, we need to think, well, what, what is the most important and how much resource should we put into responding or preparing for different events? Essentially, what matters most? So there's a number of ways you can go about this and the normal way it's described as business impact assessment. Essentially, you take a given event and you think, what is the impact on a business? Um, but the question is, what's important in the business? So what I'm going to uh, present is just my own view of how to do it. Um, it's worked for myself and I've applied this thinking to other businesses as well, not just airlines. But uh, airline, I think it works particularly well. So I, I see an airline as we can talk about the customer journey, not the journey on an aircraft, but the journey of how a customer connects with a business. So the first point that a customer connects with business is sales or booking system or people. They'll come, they'll book, book a seat, book a flight. I've been having booked that and arranged the time they turn up at the airport and the check-in is the next conference, loading their bags, checking in their bags themselves. You may be interacting with staff or maybe interacting with the IT system and a check-in console. console. And then of course, you're interacting with a customer in flight, particularly cabin crew in particular of a point of contact but the aircraft has to be ready and has to be at the right gate at the right time. And the crew have to be ready, qualified, current, qualified for the aircraft type. And then the, aircraft, um, the passengers disembark and maybe you wave goodbye to them, but hopefully you want them to come back. So retention, how you interact with the passengers um, after they've left, how you maintain contact and hopefully bring them back to, to the airline. So one way to look at, well, what's important to business is what's important to the customer? What matters to the customer? And so with that in mind, um, and the idea of what matters to the customer isn't just affect business continuity. It may be the way a business thinks about its whole operation a customer-centric or customer-focused attitude or strategy. So with that in mind, um, I myself, I built a model and my business community team, we built a model where we looked at the customer, the marketing uh, and the booking systems and people. And then they move through to deliver the service. So the airline must deliver the service to the customers. So that's the checking in, uh, flying the passengers and disembarking them safely at their destination. And then hopefully they'll come back and go through the gain business part of a business. But that can't happen without support within the business. So you've got whole parts of a business that are supporting those parts of a business that are interacting with a customer. And you've got the leadership of a business to ensure it all operates correctly, uh, the strategies met, etc. So that's a very simple model, a simplified model of the parts of a business, the leadership, the support parts the parts that gain the business and the parts that deliver the service. Now, some of that is happening in real time, real time operations, the contact with the customer, 
the check-in is real time, the flying is real time. So this is happening day on day, sometimes referred to day of operations. It's the customer will immediately notice if that part of a business isn't functioning. If they go online and the booking engine isn't working, they immediately notice. There's no delay. If they turn up at the airport and the system isn't functioning, check-in can't work, isn't working correctly, bags cannot be checked in, they immediately notice. It's a real-time operation. And of course, once they get to the aircraft, they, they expect to be to take off on time, they expect to land on time. It's a real-time business. So that's really important to understand what is real time because your response to disruption to the real time of a business has to be quick, has to be immediate. It's no point having a response that takes a day to, to respond when that's a lot of customers and a lot of flights that have been disrupted. There are other parts of a business which I've described as business imperative. They have to occur consistently to support real-time operations. For example, engineering need to be maintaining aircraft and having aircraft ready on time. Um, the aircraft have to be fueled. So the fueling contracts have to be in place. They have bills have to be paid, invoices paid, so that the real-time operations can continue to operate. So you can argue there's a parts of a business that are, if not real time, they're really important to maintain the business functioning. And then there are other parts of a business where really time is less critical. So an example, they may have to function and deliver something on a given day, for example, but it's, it's a future plan day. So, I'm thinking they're paying your tax. The tax department works on how much tax to pay and pays its tax on time. Or the investors, whoever it might be. Um, but it doesn't have to be immediate. It, it's planned. It's like in three weeks' time. Or, so those parts of business, when they're disrupted, you likely have time to respond more slowly. You may have a week to respond. If people have to go home and come back in a week's time, doesn't matter. A response process can be quite a slow process. So with that in mind, that's one way to think not only what's important to the business and therefore that you need a response plan, but also what type of response plan. Is it a real-time response plan? Is it an important response plan, but it doesn't have to be 24-7? Or is it a response that can allow some time to elapse? Mm -hmm. So the reason to break it down into these levels is because during disruption, you need to be focused on what's really important. Now, you have to be able to prioritize. There's a lot going on. It's soaking up a lot of resources probably. So you don't want to be worrying about the wrong thing. You want to be very clear. What's important now? What's important tomorrow? What's important next week? So that significantly helps the business continuity planning to have that clarity, but also very significantly helps the response process. So, We'll now go through a process. Sorry, have you got any questions on that? This isn't, you won't have seen this in textbook, I don't think, because this is a system that I personally came up with, but I've used it elsewhere and it always seems to work very well. Uh, and others have taken it and, and use it themselves. Did, did that make sense, my explanation? Can you give my explanation about the business model, like, uh, uh, lead and support or uh, gain business or deliver service. So I understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyone not follow this one? 
So just to be clear, we've got a part of a business that gains a business of outbound for business can function. We've got a part that delivers a service of outbound for business can function. That needs leadership, which is happening all the time, and it needs support. And support function is quite, quite large, but um, and then some parts of a business are real-time operations, some parts are important, but not in real time, and others, they are necessary, but they don't have to happen immediately. So there's a summary of it. Okay. So we'll just, just keep that in your mind whilst we go to the next, um, next stage of where we start to build some idea of how we were going to respond to different types of events. So I'm going to build up a series of slides here um, where we talk about the nature of impact and the types of response required on the business. One of the, to this is that some things happen quite frequently, they're common, weather disruptions, um, aircraft uh, not ready on time, um, baggage having to be offloaded. So disruption stuff that's happening, um, staff not being available, um, and that's happening all the time. So we need to recognize that is frequent and we need a response system that can routinely manage the events. Conversely, they be much less likely events and they're likely to be the more significant events. So they're frequent, likely to be not very severe and the less likely ones, they may be minor, but the more major ones such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, um, So clearly we need a different response system for these events than we do for these events. So with that in mind, I've suggested a, a diagrammatic way of showing this. We have a lot of events here, they're not very severe. We have less events here, they're probably more severe. Right at the top, we have the occasional, very se severe event. So I've effectively graded the events. So everyone with me now, everyone following, as we slowly build this up. Okay. So the nature of the impacts, this would be down at the bottom of frequent impacts, routine, and then minor problems, slight holdups, incidental, I don't know, a check-in machine um, fails, but you've got enough of them. Um, simple stuff, staff not turning up on time, okay, we can cope. Um, a holdup at the gate, we can cope. Um, a bridge jams, okay, we'll use stairs. It's just stuff that the frontline staff should be able to manage um, and are familiar with. It's not un that unexpected. However, other parts of a business may occasionally suffer an, a problem and it's likely to be localized. So for example, you may have a, a building, a relatively small building with say flight planners working from, and it loses power. So they go and find somewhere else to work, but it's not expected. It doesn't happen that often, but you need a plan. This could happen, so what's
So for example, a city power outage, wide power outage into your main headquarters or your main hub could be very significant to the business. And you need to start figuring out what are your priorities. So when I talked about business imperative, real time, less important, that's where that starts coming in. Having an understanding what is really important to keep the business functioning. And I would argue to keep the customer service running. And then lastly, there may be a very significant event and I've called this environmental paradigm shift. What I mean there is it changes the way we do business. This pandemic is a paradigm shift. 9-11 forced a paradigm shift in terms of security and how we see the threat, a terrorist threat to aircraft. Um, the global financial crisis, a lot of businesses failed. A lot of businesses think somewhat differently about how to be prepared for a type of event. So there are sometimes we have these events, SARS, this pandemic, COVID, just changes the way, we'll never quite be the same. We do it differently after this, or we are more worldly wise, shall we say. So, how do we respond to these different types of events? As how frequently they occur, how widely they impact the business, and to what extent they impact the service. So, what I'm suggesting then is that, as I've said, down at the bottom, we've got typical typical events, typical airport disrupts and problems. They happen, we all know what happens. We've probably seen it and life goes on. People do things to correct it, to overcome a problem, but life goes on. From time to time, we see examples of like business area. And as I said, loss of power to a building would be a good example. It might be, particularly if it's a building with a important team um, it, uh, working from there, that could affect the business. The next example, business-wide problems, major international event causing downturn, for example. So SARS was an example. Or SARS for a non-Asian airline, it was an example. Some Asian airlines, it was far more worse. Uh, Cafe is a, a good example where really their business stopped almost completely. And then the, the top event, an example would be, for example, aircraft accident, but not just an aircraft accident. Um, as an interesting example with Anzant Australia back in 2001, 2002, I can't quite remember, where they were, were carrying a lot of debt and they get a lot, they'd got a long way behind on their maintenance. They were 13 months behind on maintenance. Can you believe that? Um, significantly behind on maintenance. I mean, a regulator or a crack was found on an engine pylon and a regulator said, so this is CASA in Australia, ground the fleet ground the 767 fleet, which was their main fleet. And the business collapsed, it went bankrupt. So a range of events, their own fault, for getting so far behind on maintenance, then effectively the regulator losing confidence in the airline's ability to be safe, ground the fleet, business collapsed. So that's a slightly unusual example, but it happens. And numerous airlines have collapsed because of pandemic, um, this COVID pandemic. Um, and many did during the financial crisis. So with what I'm suggesting, we have four levels of, you can define the impact on a business at four different levels. Um, the 
The lower level is quite typical. We've seen them before. We see them routinely um, and they're relatively minor. Occasionally you have more significant local problems. And from time to time, business-wide problems. And lastly, occasionally, uh, events that are so significant they threaten the viability of a business. So is everyone following me now? Any questions there? No questions. No questions, good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so how do we respond? Sorry, just bear with me. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through where I believe the way to respond in an airline is. So the first one, so I just use my remains, is I've suggested here, we respond to these routine events through standard operating procedures. We write standard operating procedures or airline operating procedures, whatever term you may use. And we think we can predict this in this circumstance, this is what we'll do. And any staff member can reach for the standard operating procedure and look up, okay, I've got to call this person and arrange this. I've got to communicate with this person. I've got to let so-and-so know we need to do this. Here are my priorities. So the standard operating procedure just lets, is it simple, straightforward. This is our standard response to this type of event. And likely to include a list of people to talk to. So the next level up, so I've called that routine control. It's just routine. You don't have to really tell anyone. Your little group of people, your team just gets on, follows a standard operating procedure. If it says contact someone, you contact someone. If it says get a new piece of equipment, you go and get a new piece of equipment. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And hopefully everyone is trained. They know where to find the standard operating procedure. The next level up, I'm suggesting some coordination is required. You need to coordinate with a, perhaps another part of a business, coordinate across the teams, coordinate across shifts as part of a departmental response plan. So each department will think, well, if we lose power to our building, this is what we'll do. Or if we have a water leak, whatever it is that we can't use this building, our normal building, this is what we do. Um, so it might mean, what do we need if we're gonna move? Do we need computers? Do we need desks? Do we need telephones? What is it that you need to be able to respond to a disruption to your department? Do we need alternative supplier? The next level though, when you've got a range of departments affected or range of functions uh, affected across the business, simply coordinating within a department isn't sufficient because you've got a range of departments may all want the same resource, for example, or they can't fully communicate with them or they don't fully understand what is happening in another part of a business. So that's where I'd suggest you need a dedicated business-wide response teams. A group of people who know that they've been allocated to respond to major events and need to form up as a team to, to manage that event, to manage the priorities, to manage resources, to coordinate between departments and functions, and to communicate perhaps to the public and the customers. So a dedicated response teams, preordained, prearranged. In these circumstances, this is what we'll do. The team will form up and we'll manage the problem. And lastly, at a very top event, what I've suggested is that's what we could call command and control. The senior executive team 
just direct operations. This is what we're going to do. We're going to where the whole business is under threat. This is how we're going to respond. They might still be using the dedicated response teams, but there's clear direction. This is how we are going to survive this. What is the impact over one, say a week, two weeks, three weeks? What is a customer response going to be? What is the strategic environment? Should we be avoiding certain flight routes because of, I don't know, a war or heightened uh, concern of part of the world? Very significant decisions that will be costing, invariably costing the business, but they have to be made at the most senior level. Like I say, they'll still be calling on people below to carry on functioning and managing the detail, but very significant strategic decisions have to be made. Or for example, the chief executive may have to front with a press. Um, or to the business to, civil, to give the staff confidence. Um, a lot of decisions to be made, decisions to be made probably quite quickly, but where compromises have to be made, we'll, we'll accept uh, that part of a business won't function, but we'll keep this part working, for example. So does that make sense to people? Are there any questions around that? Does anyone? Disagree. So I have one question. If uh, whether there's a issue, an issue that you categorize it into, for example, major business-wide problems like COVID, for example. But uh, when the issue getting so long, for example, for COVID, it is like two years already. So do you ever categorize it again into a lower level because it's become normal now? Mm. Interesting question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, I suppose that's a really important point that these these teams can only function for a certain time because it's taken up a whole of their mental capacity and their resources. But part of their response may be, okay, we need to redevelop our, our procedures or redevelop our network or juice uh, routes. And that gets fed back down into the business to carry, to carry that out. Um, but I would suggest that even at this level in a the pandemic, there is still a strategic picture being maintained. So we've got a new variant of a pandemic, a new variant. Okay, what does that mean in the long term? Let's form up and think through the strategy. How are we going to survive this? So, yeah, I think it's a really important point you make. It's really good, but they make decisions and pass the decisions down to be implemented. And then one decision may be if negotiate or talk with the government agencies and the health agencies to assist in the development of border controls, for example, or to communicate the impacts of border controls. But it, but then is still there's still a strategic picture being developed and maintained. Um, and as as the situation evolves, okay, we'll change the way we're responding. But yeah, so it's really important point. But yeah, effectively you're saying, do they become routine? And I guess we could argue now that cabin cleaning, mask wearing, testing has almost become routine. So it's happening down in the business following procedures. But the moment this context changes, it goes back up to a more senior level for decisions before coming back down. It's a trend. I mean, this pandemic has gone on so long. It's a great example where 
I suppose we've we've had to make the non-routine routine, um, and change changes occurring. Um, I'm sure there'll be new rules in place very quickly soon over the next few weeks, particularly perhaps in Europe and the United States. Yeah, thanks for that question. Really important, really interesting point. Um, any other points raised? Yes, Professor, I just want to ask whether this model conflict with the risk assessment model because we already have the risk assessment model which already assess through like monthly assessment for all the unit in a business. Why we have to do this one and um, in which case we gonna do this one versus risk assessment model. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, interesting question. Later on, we will be visiting the risk assessment process actually. Um, it's not in these slides. The next slide pack has actually spent quite a lot of time on, on the risk assessment piece. Um, what this is saying is each department may do a risk assessment, a business might do a risk assessment, but there comes a point where if it's just done independently by each department, their solution, their, their mitigation for a given risk may not match the mitigation of another department. And you could get a conflict of resources, for example, or conflict of requirements. So um, you will see as we go later, yes, a risk assessment must be done, but there needs to be a consistency across the business. And even if you've done a risk assessment, a risk assessment will have identified mitigations. So for example, a mitigation might be write a standard operating procedure. A mitigation may be we'll have a fallback location where we can operate from. So that's a mitigation identified as part of a risk management process. A mitig uh, mitigation may be for a very significant problem in the business is we need a coordinated response. The detail of that will come out of a risk assessment, but it has to be coordinated. Does that make sense? Um, the next model I'm gonna show, I think it will make more sense. Um, but I think the key point is there comes a level of a disruption where there has to be a coordinated response. There has to be the ability to make prioritization across the business. Not everyone can respond as they wish because maybe there, there needs to be a different priority. We can we can come. I'll make a note and we'll come back to this. Actually, thank you. Um, it could be later today, or might even be tomorrow. But I'll make a note now. After or when we're doing the risk assessment part, to come back to this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, that's really good. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, any other comments? We've had two really, really good comments there um, or points. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. The next problem we've got to solve is, this is all very well, but how do we know? Sorry, let me just check this note. Got another slide here. Looks exactly the same. Oh, very good. So in summary, what I'm suggesting is have a routine frequent events. We just employ normal business processes, particularly in the airline, but disruption is normal, it, things happen. 
And so we build that into the business, business as usual. And this level coordinated, but it's still within the departmental level. So a department could carry out a risk assessment and find, oh, well, this is what we'll do in these circumstances. This one, because of a need to prioritize across the business as a centralized response. This is more important today than that. We'll do that later sort of type of decision. What routes to fly, what routes not to. And then at this most senior level, command and control, executive control. This is what we'll do to keep a business afloat, to protect the business even now, or what's our strategy going forward. Okay. We've got to know then, um, think, well, how do we, it's all very well having a coordinated approach or centralized approach, but we just somehow know that we've got to instigate a response. And that might be potentially quite difficult because it could be happening at a small airport or the main airport or the headquarters, not quite sure where the event could occur. So the event occurs, whatever it might be, complete IT failure. So first you've got to decide, well, what level of event is this? Is how extensive, what parts of a business are affected? Do we need a coordinated response or would you, do we need a centralized response? Do we need to start making priorities? So there needs to be at least a core people, a set of people who can make an assessment of what is happening across the business, how extensive. And they might say, no problem, the airport will manage it, the airport manager will manage it, uh, the staff will manage it, they'll just follow standard operating procedures, no need to be involved. But if it's a departmental level response, then okay, business continuity plans need to be followed, someone needs to reach for a plan, okay, what did we decide we would do under these circumstances? Reach for a plan. It's not a standard operating procedure, it's um, we, we, we think we understand what we would do. Let's get out of a plan and figure out what we did when we had the time to think about it, not now when all the pressure is on and the stress is on. What did we plan to do? And a lot of business continuity planning or business continuity management is about writing, preparing plans. But at a more, senior, uh, a more significant level, a centralized response, you need a major disruption plan. This is more than a, just a simple plan. This is a business-wide plan. How are we going to respond to major disruptions? And it may well be you need to break the team down. There may be a team who are focused on operations and a team that are focused on protecting the business. For example, payroll, um, communications, internal communications, uh, a whole range of activity that might be about just how the business operates versus how the operations are maintained. And then lastly, at the most senior level, you may have decided, right, we will have a group emergency management team. We'll have these people will form a core team in the end of a significant event. So I'm not suggesting this is the only way to do it, but Certainly, you need to know who will step in at a certain level of, of incident. And it may be that you need a core group of people who are always aware of what's going on and say, OK, we need to instigate this level of response. So that might be a business continuity manager or a business impact team. But they have to be that assessment has to be ready to be made at any time because airlines are 24 seven business.
Okay. Um, any questions on that before we move to the next bit? Which I, the next bit I'm going to give in a case case study of a a business continuity plan for a fairly significant event. No comments. Okay. So, an example. This is a real example. Uh, we looked. We did carry on carried out business continuity planning activity, and we identified there was a very significant building, a building that we couldn't afford uh, to lose because of so much was activity was carried out from that building. And that activity, the main one was airline operations, a building where airline operations was carried out. We thought, okay, so if there's a water leak in the roof, uh, power outage, fire, how are we gonna run the operation? How are we gonna run the airline? Everything was in the one building. And it wasn't, a, shall we say, a specially designed building. It wasn't a, a hardened building. of our exercise was to create a local alternative site for the critical functions that are carried out within the operations center. So flight planning, so these, these critical functions are the obvious ones are operations delivery, flight dispatch, maintenance watch, navigation services, aircraft performance, calculations, ground operations, and in that particular building, there was also the group emergency control center for an aircraft accident. Uh, not just our own aircraft, but also aircraft of a number of subsidiaries. So it was a really important building. Um, any one of those, uh, if any, any one of those critical functions wasn't available, the aircraft would soon not be flying but with all of them could potentially have been lost at the same time. So what do we do about this? They had special servers, they had special connectivity. There was a whole range of people that had to be available to operate the airline. So this was what we call a business impact assessment. We didn't I suppose this is part of our risk assessment process. We identified that the consequence of a loss of this building for whatever reason was significant, a significant consequence. And we also identified because it wasn't a specially built building, it could happen. It was more than possible that this could happen. Um, by chance, it was right next to a main a road with a large field depot on the other side. So it could have been a fire in the field depot. That would have meant evacuating the building. Um, like I say, power could fail, water systems could fail, uh, sewage systems could fail. Um, could be an earthquake. So what are we gonna do about this? So it's, it's a major, potentially major event or consequence and it's credible. So the decision was to set up an alternative location. So we went around and we considered what other locations are available to us that has good connectivity, is completely separate power supplies, is not fed from the same road system. We went through all the different services um, that were needed to enable people to work from the buildings and identified a building not too far away, uh, but on separate supplies, well-built and with some sufficient room and just set up an alternative operation center. Working with each of the teams, what is it you absolutely need to function at least for a week? 
and so each team worked out, well, we need access to these documents. We need access to these IT systems. We need a, a desk. We need two people sitting side by side, whatever it might be. We need telephones and just put in place the absolute minimum required to enable that to work. And in this case, like I say, it was a pretty well built building, plenty of car parking, easy access, but not the same access as a normal building. Uh, and available to us. So we didn't have to lease another building, for example, or have one ready. So the key steps we had to go was understand each department's critical needs. What did they need to enable them to carry out their function? What staff do they need? What IT systems, phone systems, data connectivity, radio communications, or any other dependency? We identified a suitable facility or alternative working arrangement. So not everyone went there. Some people could work from a different location. They didn't need to be part of the same location. So excuse that type of spelling error. Tapped the identified facility to meet requirements. We figured out, okay, this room is big enough. It has the connections or we will put in place the connections needed. We'll put in place for desks and computer terminals, et cetera. For example, voice, data, power. And then to make sure that this would work every time, we've developed the documentation and the business continuity plans to say, this is what it'll do. So each department had a copy of exactly, in this event, you cannot operate from this building. This is your response. So, it takes. You also need to ensure you've got the right equipment. So in this case, we determined we also needed some satellite phones because we weren't convinced with our telephone connectivity was as robust as it needed to be. And in fact, we fitted the building with additional aerials so that the phones could be used inside. We ensured that all the equipment such as computers that could connect through say a satellite system were available. But in turn, that meant that each of these had to be kept, um, right software updates, um, batteries checked occasionally, charged occasionally. So everything very carefully arranged and also in grab bags or so that people could grab them and take them with them. All sorts of practical issues. For example, some of our destinations were very remote, for example, in the Pacific Islands. How are we gonna to talk to them under these circumstances? So, okay, we'll use a satellite phone system, for example. Um, it had to be cost effective. We don't want to spend too much money on this. Um, so use what's practical, what will achieve the aim without being, shall we say, gold plated. need to understand more. Under those circumstances, this is our response. This is how you, the IT department, needs to support that. Uh, management of changes during a project. Uh, clearly, if each of these departments changed the way they did business, we needed to understand that so the, the response plan could be updated. And lastly, we had to ensure readiness were people ready to use the plans? How often do they have to be reminded of the plans? How often did we, should we be doing exercises to prove the plans? So that readiness bit and the risk part that we've mentioned just now, we're gonna come up to next and put that all into some structure. A 
Okay, so that's a case. So that's a real example. That's what was done. Um, it was one of the first, probably the most significant centralized um, response plans of a whole suite of plans across the business because it was, it had to respond quickly. Um, we couldn't, we needed a minimum time between the building being evacuated and the new function operating. Wherever other parts of a business didn't need that response time, they could, they're imperative, but they could uh, say take two or three hours to set up. Where other parts of a business, is, if you remember the customer journey, some parts are real time, some parts are imperative, but not in real time. And then others are supporting functions that could delay their response. Uh, an obvious one would be say, like I said, paying tax. Well, okay, you know when you're gonna pay tax, it's probably been already set up. You might as well send them on leave I mean, go go home for a week. Um, so it offloads some of the load on on the response. Conversely, you may have payroll, for example. You know you have to pay people on a certain day. Okay, so payroll might need to respond relatively quickly to get that done. Um, and then, like I say, this is an example of a, a part of a business that had to be able to respond immediately. So have you got any examples like that yourself? So a parts of a business uh, set up with a, or a fall, shall we say a fallback or failover system? No? Okay. Um, the other example, a really good example of this sort of immediate response is the IT system, a failover system for IT and where so many airlines have been called out because they didn't have a failover system. Um, I, I'm mindful of when we were going through this period, it took us oh, a couple of years of work to get all these plans in place. One of the things we found was we had two data centers. And my immediate thought was, oh, that's very good. They've clearly got that sorted. I didn't worry about it too much. But then some months later, it turned out that the development team had decided to use the fallback site to run part of a system whilst they developed another system on the main servers. So the situation we discovered was we needed both data centers to be functioning for the airline to work. So we double the chance of a failure. So the idea was good, but because it hadn't been properly documented and rules hadn't been written about it, it had deteriorated to the point where we actually were very, very vulnerable. Either data center had a problem, everything would have stopped. So, you prepare the plans, you do the exercises, you check it's all working, but then you've got to maintain it. You've got to ensure as, as people change, change roles, it isn't forgotten. Build rules to ensure that building is only used for this, you know, for example. If we've got a fallback data center, it is the fallback data center. It is not a development center, for example. Set in place policies and rules to protect planning system. Okay, so you may have got a sense there, there's quite a bit of work here. There's, there's equipment to buy, there's people employed full-time to develop the plans. Um, there's people being taken off a main activity to help test in plans and help write in plans and showing they're correct. So this is resources. So an obvious question is, well, how much resource should be going to business continuity planning. It's not part of a business that can justify itself by how much income it generates. 
because it doesn't generate any income. Its benefit is only seen during a disruption. It's not the only part of a business like that, of course, but it does, does raise this question. So certainly as part of this work and I've done for some uh, clients more recently is we've looked at, well, how much resource should be put into this? Effectively, how much risk is there and therefore how much mitigation effort should go into it? And so interestingly, um, it's a bit like safety department. It doesn't generate any income. So how much effort should go into it? Business economy manager function does not generate cash flow. How, so how do you determine how much effort and resource should be applied? How much risk? It's effectively uh, as a tension, more resource, less resource, more cost, more protection. How much do you protect the business versus but one way it's described as a tension between protection versus how much cost. And that's not an easy balance. It's not easy to work that out. Um, and that's part of a risk process we'll be going through shortly. Now, just by chance, I've got some numbers here. They're a bit dated, but um, it's interesting. It's a, it's a te uh, sorry, for some research carried out by Deloitte's for exactly asking this question. But instead of asking how much should be spent, they looked at how much people were spending. So like I say, it's a bit dated, but you get the, uh, hopefully you'll get the idea of what they found. I've used the dated one because I haven't found a more recent one that's really as clear. Sorry, my slides aren't moving forward, why is that? Okay. So like I say, somewhat dated, um, but this is what they found. They looked across all industries and their revenue. So a revenue of, if this is in US dollars, revenue of less than 10 million US dollars. And they also looked, so they then looked at the average budget and number of people, full-time equivalent people employed to protect the business. And the numbers were surprisingly high in my mind. So they found that for businesses of less than 10 million, quite large businesses still, but they're, they're not that big. There was a range, it was a significant range of, of less than one person, I, it wasn't a full-time role, through to five persons and about $1.7 million spent. And at the very highest level, at a very significant business, over $5 billion, they were typically spending over $17 million and had 8.6 people. So they had various teams, but you can imagine five in some, 10 in others more. So that myself is, uh, that's the best benchmark I've a job well because you could argue that some of the key mitigations are actually quite cheap and not all but some are um, but they've got to be in place and they've got to be effective so a diesel generator doesn't cost much but it's got to work you have it maintained it's got to start when you need it it's got to be correctly configured and how it's connected the building has to be correct so it has to be done right an extra telephone line or fiber connection isn't particularly expensive, but it has to have come a different way. It has to be not subject to the same threats and not from the same source. So um, all the mitigation 
planning has to be done correctly. Um, so I think that is perhaps more important than exactly how much you're spending is do it right. Mm. Really have the right people, people who are enthusiastic about it. Um, some people love this sort of work. They like working in the response field. So that's what sort of people you want. People who can put, can picture something going wrong and have got a compassion to prevent it going wrong or be able to respond to it. Okay, so I've covered quite a bit there. I'll just recap a little bit perhaps. Um, So I'm just checking the time now. Uh, okay, we're eight minutes to the break. So yeah, I'll quickly recap uh, because I appreciate I've gone through quite a lot. So I started by building up this uh, concept of different levels of response, the frequent minor stuff through to the less frequent significant events and how it how the how that looks in the building, uh, in the business. Typical airport disrupts, for example, losses of power, for example, major down to international event or a near-death near death experience as it was called in ANSAT or as it was called in Air New Zealand but owned ANSAT at the time. And so we can employ normal business processes for the minor stuff, the frequent stuff, we may have to have a coordinated sort of department level response to local problems. However, if there's an incident that affects across a business, we may have to centralize the response so we can prioritize what's important, where to focus the effort. And lastly, there are occasionally very significant events that really needs the executive team to take a strategic view and decide how to respond. I suggested that that in turn might mean that there's different teams responding, standard operating procedures, using business continuity plans, maybe have a disruption team uh, or teams. And lastly, you may have an emergency response team. And then I set out a case study of identifying a critical facility, finding that it was vulnerable, simple risk assessment, consequences are significant, it could happen. It's credible, more than credible. So what do you do about it? Worked out, okay, we'll have an alternative location. We'll set it up so that it, the people can work from that location and we'll give them the equipment necessary to do that and not just at the location but at some of the aid stations and then lastly having said well that's can be quite costly how much do you spend and i showed this benchmarking study from some time ago that gives some indication of what is typical across industries not just the airlines just industries in general uh, Yes, so we got a question regarding for the uh, FTE support. Uh, so basically, what is this uh, relationship and the meaning of it with uh, affecting with the, the BCM modules and also the revenue as well? What is the relationship and how you can calculate it? Yeah, so, so firstly, does everyone understand this term FTE, full time equivalent? So, um, it could be two people working part time, and so they're equivalent to one person working full time. So full time equivalent. So that could have been ten people on half, half, um, two or three days a week, uh, versus five people, five days a week. So just to make sure everyone is sort of at um, full time equivalent. So what we determined, and I, I asked the internal audit team, I asked the financial team, I said, how do you how do we decide how much we should spend and how many staff should we have in the department? And they said, well, you can't really calculate it. It depends on the level of risk. How do you determine risk? Well, it's quite complicated. Okay, well, let's see what other people do. 
And this is where that Deloitte study came out. And they'd done that work, they'd researched, surveyed a, a lot of companies and said, this is typical, this relationship is, is typical. These larger companies, it was fairly easy to set out these numbers. Every smaller number, it could be a range, it could be not many people employed, to a number of people employed, and they're probably dependent on the nature of, of the industry. Does that make sense? Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, was that taken from the report from Deloitte? So could you please perhaps um, send us the link maybe to access this? So we can- Sure, sure. Uh, I'll try and find it again. Yeah. Please. Uh, um, like I say, I've used this one because I haven't found a better one yet, mm -hmm. but it is a little old. So maybe we'll PCB. Um, and uh, was this your way with like taking for uh, calculate in one year, annual, or, or it's going to be monthly or? Oh, right. Yes. No, that was annual. Annual. Uh, annual. Mm. That number looks a bit big to me. That, that seems a lot of money to spend if you're a $10 million business. This looks, this number looks right to me. This is, but I'm, I'm a bit suspicious. This, this looks too big to me. I'm not sure why, why it's bigger than this number, for example. But that's what they reported. Mm. And even this number was always free low ones. Somehow that's smaller than that number and smaller than that number, but that's what they reported. So it's interesting. Uh, yeah. But it's about the same. It's about, you know, five, one and a half million dollars. Mm. Uh, I can certainly um, just research, see and find um, a link to that one again. And if not, then certainly to others. Mm. Yeah. Uh, vâng ạ, em xin giải thích BCM là viết tắt của Business Continuity Management là uh, quản lý điều hành liên tục ạ, quản lý liên tục đấy ạ, BCM là viết tắt của, của cái từ đấy ạ. Ok, um, it looks like it's break time. Um, I had a few other slides which I think I know I'm going to leave out now because the question of risk has come up and I think we need to address that risk question. Um, rather than introduce another concept first. So after a break, we'll start on a risk question, if everyone's okay. There's one question to confirm uh, my understanding that uh, this uh, table show that uh, the, uh, the big uh, company is it to pay more for BCM. Uh, is it uh, correlated uh, about the investment on BCM with their revenue? Uh, what I think is happening, partly the larger companies are more complex. They are more, they have more facilities. There's more, um, more risk effect in effect. They have more to lose also. So there's a range of factors I think that are happening. Um, certainly there has to be a balance between what can be lost, the value of a business and how much you spend to protect it. A small business, it only has a certain amount of resource it can't afford anymore. So you would expect the large business to be spending significantly more, partly by more complex, more facilities, more suppliers, more customers. But I, I, you know, I wouldn't say you have to match this, just this is what Deloitte's found. Hmm. And it's what you would expect, but I'd go a bit further maybe, just picking up on your question. I gave the example about the international standard, which I think is too complicated. It's too involved. You imagine the resources to do all that? Do you really need, can you keep it simple? Can you keep it pragmatic and to the point? So I think it can be done very efficiently, but it needs clarity. What exactly are we doing? What's the best way to do it? Um, and the other, possibly you could argue an airline, it's, there's a lot of people in airline who can make decisions quickly. So maybe we, there's a benefit that we have the right sort of people. We have experts in all sorts of fields, well-trained, 
So maybe we're better equipped as an airline than some other businesses. Not all businesses, but some other some other types of business. Mm. Thank you for your explanation. Okay, um, it's now break time, so we've got 15 minutes, is that right? Uh, yes, right. Okay, quarter past. And then, like I say, I'm going to skip some slides now. I'm going to go straight into the risk piece. Mm -hmm. Vâng, mọi người ơi, tí nữa 3 giờ 15 chúng ta sẽ quay trở lại ạ. Có 15 phút break ạ. Cảm ơn 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 ạ.